I can hear you asking, Michelle, why are you wearing a long sleeve tube dress when it's 35 degrees outside? I don't know, but here we are. Hello friends, my name is Michelle, it is the 30th of June and that means that we are gathered here today to talk about all the books I read this month. I have completed a total of 10 books I want to say, my statistics honestly could be wrong because I'm overheating and it's like a whole situation, so I'm a little bit confused, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And I even forgot my little neat notebook that tells me the order in which these books go because we're gonna talk about them from my least favorite to my most favorite, so where is my little handy dandy notebook? Give me a second. I'm back. I have my little handy dandy. My entire house is in disarray because I was just filming the media book freakout tag and books are everywhere. Every surface covered in books currently. <laughs> my least favorite book of the month is at the very bottom because it's the first book I finished <laughs> this month and it is Angel Maker, my TBR dark pick for May that I started in May but finished in June. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to talk about it. I don't know what this is about. It's, it does this have a real plot other than the main character needs to bang somebody? I don't know, like it says a lot of plot here, but I honestly don't want to go over it with you. Killer Bees, okay? Killer Machine Bees. I bent a little corner for every single page that had something on it that I thought was problematic, sexist, insensitive, fatphobic, etc, etc. I don't know if you can tell from this, but there's literally so many. I don't like this book and I don't want to talk about it too much, but it is really so sexist. Every single woman in this book is either not even addressed, just like described by a male character as somebody who is hot and sexy and bangable. There's a sapphic character in this and her entire storyline, Lily... I don't, I'm gonna get mad and I don't want to rant and get mad. I want to be happy. <laughs> I don't want to get mad. It is literally also so fatphobic. Literally the description of a plus size character is described with like, oh my god, a rare sight, a fat person running. I'm just so mad at the language in this book. It's so 2012. It made me think that the world really should have ended in 2012 when this book was released. Next up, a disappointing book, let's say. Mistakes Were Made by Meryl Wilsner. This is about an age gap romance where a college student sleeps with an older woman and then discovers that it is in fact the mother of her college best friend and they continue banging and continue hiding it from the person. I thought this was poorly developed, we didn't get enough emotional development at all, we didn't learn to communicate. The only thing that we learned over and over again is how much these two women thought that the other was just so hot and all the different ways that they could have sex. But that's not why I'm reading a romance book. I would have read an erotica book for that. I want the emotional, I want the growing, I want the banter, I want the casual situations, not just several ways how to bang in a single house or in a single room or on a motorbike or what you can do to another person. Like, it was hot, okay? When the smut was there, it was very, very hot, which is why I wish this was just an erotica novel so I could enjoy it. But no, we were just stalling so hard on any emotional connection on any kind of emotional growth it was, it's fine like it's a three star you know it was very hot and I enjoyed the characters individually but my lord was this lacking in depth for me next up I have an arc I read a fatal attraction if you wear around booktube and like 2015 or something, um, the most popular thriller of all time at that point was that Girl in 6E, right? I've never read it, I don't think I ever will, but it was by the same author as Fatal Affair. When I saw it, it was on Read Now on NetGalley, I was like, let me get that. And I read that, and that's it. It's a book I read. It's set in Los Angeles, you're following multiple perspectives as they are trying to kind of solve this murder. They're like these super famous like twin brothers in LA, you know, actors, and one of them is found dead with, together with a dead woman who had been tortured prior to being killed, and we need to figure out who did it, and why, and what's happening, and was the brother guilty, yada, yada, yada. There's a whole as like detective pop that I was not a fan of, because I just don't like those. I think they're kind of boring. I felt like the setup was super interesting, I was so into it for the first half, but then the second half kind of just like fizzled out because nothing was happening in terms of the characters. The detective was the detective. What, what, does she have a personality aside from being the detective? I don't think so. Does the lead actress have a single personality trait that's not wanting to be the lead actress? Like, everybody is just so, not even like, 
one or two dimensional. They're just flat. They're like stale bread. But anyway, not the best of times. It was just the thing I read. It was three stars still because, like I said, the first half was really intriguing and interesting. But ultimately, my lord, rich people problems. Am I right? Will I ever like a book? <laughs> especially a thriller book that has rich people in it. This is the reason I don't like Karen and McManus when it comes to YA. This is why I don't like Rachel Hawkins after reading whatever that book was called, The Restle Reckless Girls or something like that. Rich people problems. Literally just <laughs> could, could not be me. Listen, I am severely unemployed. Do you think that I will really feel sorry for somebody who's like earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a month? Probably not. Next up, I have a book that I featured in a vlog, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, that is Someday We Will Fly by Rachel DeVoskin. I don't even know if I've been saying the authors, but you know what I mean. <laughs> this is about Lilia, who grows up in Warsaw, and then in the 40s, as the World War II really takes up a lot of speed, she, her sister, and her dad make the journey to Shanghai in China, where they live in the Jewish community there. I talked about and discussed, you know, World War II fiction and the Jewish community in Shanghai, etc., etc., so I will send you to the vlog here. You should check it out. I'm super proud of that vlog. <laughs> just saying. This is like a coming-of-age story where it's literally just describing the daily life of Lilia as she was in the Jewish community in China at that time. Obviously, it also includes the happenings of the Second World War, but it's literally just about her and her family and the people that she meets and the relationship that she, the relationships she has with the people around her. And I don't know, I think it has cool motives. I think it was a pretty solid book. I really liked the writing. It was just like not my favorite, but we are getting to like the stronger three stars with one exception <laughs> that's coming up. But it just felt right in this placement. The next two could honestly sit in the same spot, but I decided to talk about Scatter of Light first. This is about Aria, who is spending the summer with her grandmother, and there she meets a group of queer people that she starts spending time with. And she starts questioning her identity. She has been identifying as straight her whole life. And she has had relationships with boys. And then she kind of starts reflecting on those. And why they didn't work. And is she queer? And in what way? Etc. Etc. I feel like it was not the best coming of age story. It's definitely not a light rom-com. If you think that that's what this is. Because it has a lot of heavy topics. Including like death in the family, mind you. That's a big part of it towards the end. Um, there's also cheating and the fact is that like one of the main storylines is that I'm not going to say any details or characters but I felt like it was handled so poorly and then just kind of like brushed off towards the end so I was not a big fan of that the writing is gorgeous I feel like this is the most beautiful Melindolo writing that I have read so far so that's why it's so high up otherwise it would probably go down because I just have a lot of issues with how that specific storyline was handled regardless of whether it is or isn't a light rom-com or supposed to be you know even if it's not supposed to be a light rom-com i still felt like that was handled poorly and it was a completely different book than i thought it was going to be on the same spot i have pedro and daniel which is a semi-autobiographical fictionalized story about two brothers who are both gay and they are growing up in this kind of abusive household in the 80s 90s for everything that i appreciated i thought it was kind of boring <laughs> I was, I've been thinking about this because I was like, why did I not appreciate it more for what it was? Because technically it's a really good book and I appreciate like the craft side of it a lot. I will get to that. But on the other hand, I was like, why am I not five-starring this then? And I was like, because I was bored. It's because I was bored. <laughs> I will say that I really, really appreciated the way it was written. It was so smart and it was amazing to watch the language change because when they are children, the writing is truly so simple. So it reflects when these two brothers were children. But then it kind of develops and becomes so lush and beautiful as they're growing up and, you know, picking up vocabulary and everything. That was gorgeous. I loved watching that happen. Like, the craft side of this was incredible and I would highly recommend it still, especially because it's by a Amer Mexican-American author, which you don't see often, especially in this format. It plays with format. There are illustrations. It's great. It was just boring to me, and I don't know why. I feel like Pedro and Danielle was like a 3.5. I'm finally getting to my four stars. First up, let's talk about Queen of Coin and Whispers by Helen Corcoran. This is about a spy master who accepts the position of spy master so she can take revenge for her father's death. And it is about a new queen who takes the throne after her uncle dies. And it is about them working together, because obviously the spy master works for the queen. Duh. And how they're trying to dismantle this corrupt system <laughs> the previous king and his 
Spymaster uh, kind of built together to kind of, you know, gather money for themselves, etc, etc. It's very reflective of our real world, if you know what I mean. It's beautifully sapphic. I had some issues with this. It was four stars because I flew through this and it was a great reading experience. I just had like little nitpicky things that I didn't love about it. Like, for example, I felt like sometimes we sacrifice romantic scenes for political scenes and sometimes we sacrifice political scenes for the romance. So I felt like I didn't get enough of either. So I was almost like, why is this not a duology so we can develop everything properly? But it dances very neatly on the cusp between young adult and adult. So if you're ever looking for like a transition from your regular, regular, schmegular YA fantasy into adult fantasy and you want to do it in a queer way, I feel like, coin, like Queen of Coin and Whispers is a really good way to do it because I feel like it really works as kind of a stepping stone when you want to go from one to the other. Overall, it was a great reading experience, like I said. It was just like those few small things that I wasn't the biggest fan of, okay? We are getting to number three. I have House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson. I like this so much more than Year of the Witching. I could not... Mm. <laughs> Don't even get me started, even though I still have things to say about this one, which I did in the same vlog as Someday We Will Fly, so you will find me there talking about Slovak true crime, <laughs> technically, like historical, but true crime. This is about Marion, who is not satisfied with her life, so she answers a net in a paper for somebody who's looking for a blood mate, which essentially means that somebody is feasting on your blood. So she goes to this country where this countess lives, who is based on like a historical figure from where I live, which like never happens. Why didn't you credit our little country, Alexis? Do you know how much it would help tourism? <laughs> like, come on, we need it desperately. It's sapphic, it's about toxic relationship and dynamic between the two of them. It has a beautiful, gory, bloody, like, out there ending, which I also really appreciated. I would have liked a different ending overall, but that's for another discussion that I talk about there. But this was fun. It was so atmospheric. I think that's why it's so high up and why I gave it such a huge rating. Because even though I was not the biggest fan of the ending and it felt kind of short, like we kind of just like wrapped it up very quickly without like more of my questions being answered. It was just so atmospheric. I loved the writing in this so much, so much. It was everything. It was like I was completely transported into this castle and I was living with these maids and I was living with this countess and I just felt everything because of the strong atmosphere. It is a beautiful, vampiric, gothic story and I loved it a lot. Number two, I have a surprise. <laughs> I have The Oleander Sword, which is the sequel to The Jasmine Throne. I have talked about this book in like three previous videos, so I feel like I have talked about this to filth, but the Jasmine Throne is about the Emperor's sister who refuses to do what he wants her to do, so he imprisons her. And it is about this girl who was supposed to be like a priestess. I still don't know if it's like, if priestess is the right word, you know? She becomes an elder after going through these magical waters, okay? So her, who was supposed to be that, serving as a maid and then kind of like helping to save the princess in the Jasmine Throne. And this is a sequel. It is so much more political. There's so much more scheming going on. The pops are so much stronger. The plot is so much tighter. I was so much more connected to everybody and I adored this. Like this was so much better than the Jasmine Throne to me. Like I am standing this book. I want everybody to read it. If you have read Jasmine Throne, pick this up immediately. Stat. If you haven't read the Jasmine Throne, please read it so you can get to the Oleander Sword. I'm just a huge fan of this magical world in general. Like the way it is built. It takes from South Asian lore, I think, or mythology. And it's just so lush with description. The things, the magical things that are happening, like this fire things and this plague things. So good! So good! So descriptive, so visual, and just like so interesting and intricate. And I just love all the schemes in this book and the love confessions in this book. I was gasping! I was gasping! I was like, you can't do this to me, this is too strong. The emotion is too strong. I don't know what to do with myself. Come on. It was just so good. It was like top-notch reading experience. But it was not as good as my number one book of the month, which is Plain Bit Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. Am I that girl? Am I that girl? I guess I'm that girl. This is about a school for girls in 1902 where a series of tragic deaths happens. And then it's about a current day contemporary film crew from LA making a movie based on those events and what happens with these characters. And I, <laughs> I love this so much. It's literally over 600 pages, but I am obsessed with this book. Again, I've talked about it so much recently that I feel like nobody wants to hear it anymore. But listen, I just love how messed up these characters are. Nobody's a good person. Literally show me one good person. I think the person 
was taking care of the plants and like unloading these vans when they get to location i think they are a good person <laughs> and that's like the only good person <laughs> in this book everybody else is antagonistic in some way shape or form and i love it it makes you uncomfortable it makes you think like but would i do anything different in that situation i mean in most of those situations i would like to believe yes but like you know it makes you think if like you as a person and i feel some people don't like the answer to those questions that this book makes you ask but it is also such a good discussion on how men in power have manipulated women into these unfortunate situations to the point where they can barely do anything but make horrible mistakes and make horrible decisions etc etc i loved the snarky narrator as well which is not something that i would usually enjoy ever in anything i love the footnotes i laughed i didn't cry but i laughed in this book i was super invested the whole time and i'm so happy with the ending so many people hate the ending from the reviews that i've read and like i understand i guess but i loved it i thought it was a perfect ending however this is not a book that i would just go on a whim and say hey I think this is broadly recommendable. Definitely not, I think. I think this is for a very niche audience and you also have to pick it up in the right time for you, I think, in order to really enjoy it. So I'm not like, if somebody asks me, do you think I would like it? I'm not really comfortable giving a specific answer. I think it depends on too many factors. <laughs> and I think that it's definitely not the a book that everybody would like, if you know what I mean. It's not like broadly, to recommend this broadly. I cannot imagine it, I don't see it. But I personally, mm, I love this book so much. That was all the books I read in June. It was kind of a mediocre month with like a couple of really strong wins, if you know what I mean. You will notice that I did not mention a brief history of Seven Killings. It is the 30th of June. I have about 20 pages left in a book that I'm currently reading, so I'm going to start this today. So it still counts for June. I'm not going to just get rid of it. Also because I realized, my dumbass realized, that I also bought this in Paris in Shakespeare and Company. So I cannot possibly get rid of this. I have to at least give it a try. And if I DNF it, that's okay. Okay, I can still put it back on my shelves, but I don't want to get rid of this, so I'm going to start it today. At least for July, I don't have as many stupid plans. I had really two big vlogs to do in June, so that hindered me picking this up. And I also had to finish Angel Maker. I'm really hoping I can pick something shorter from the TBR jar so that I can actually get to it in time and I don't have to carry it over into the next month because it messes with my reading plans. But I will try my best to read this in July. I will let you know how it goes in you know, my July wrap-up. Hopefully better than freaking Angel Maker. Hopefully this will be good. But I am reading it. Okay, just so you know, I'm not like giving up on the challenge. I'm not getting rid of this. I am going to do my freaking best to read this. I'm starting this today and then we will see what happens. I will start it today and then, and then tomorrow I have a buddy reading day with my girlfriend where we're going to read something different that she's going to pick. And then I'm going to pick this back up and we will see if I'm in any way, shape or form interested in it. And then I will let you know how I feel about it. Let's move on to what I'm gonna pick for July and we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that it's going to be something better. If you are new here, the way I do my TBR jar, there's 12 books in here. Six of them I want to read. They are written in black ink. And then six of them I don't want to read for one reason or another. <laughs> they, they are in blue ink. These are all taken from my oldest TBR books that I have owned for like four plus years at this point, I think. So these are books that I never reach for. That's why they're here in this way. And we're gonna pick one and we are just gonna hope. I had like two or three books I didn't want to read back to back. So I would be really thankful if we could get to something that would make my heart sing with joy. I am picking this one and I'm scared because I still have some really big ones there. That, I don't want to say that it looks, but is it black? No, that's blue, isn't it? I have to zoom you in again. My apologies. I'm not looking at the title. This is what we'll be reading. Okay, this is so much better. Oh my god. Did you hear that? Real, real crash bang wallop. That was my heart falling through my ass because this is so much better. Give me a second. <laughs> Look at this. That's readable. This is Olive Kittredge by Elizabeth Trout. The reason I own this book is that I watched the HBO miniseries with Frances McDermott and the last episode made me cry so fucking hard like a baby. I remember watching all four or five episodes in one evening and just being completely emotionally devastated from it because of Olive Kittredge, the main character. And I thought it was written so cleverly for the TV show. And I wanted to read this. So I bought it. And then I started it one day. But it was a really stressful time in my life. And I read like 20 pages. And I, I respectfully put it back. 
I, I soft DNF'd it, <laughs> you know, at that time. And ever since then, I'm just scared that I will never find it in me to actually enjoy this. Let's read what it's about together so you also have a grasp on what we're doing here. <clears throat> Olive Kittredge. Indomitable, compassionate, and often unpredictable. A retired school teacher in a small coastal town in Maine, as she grows older, she struggles to make sense of the changes in her life. She is a woman who sees into the hearts of those around her their triumphs and tragedies. A penetrating, vibrant exploration of the human soul, the story of Olive Kittredge will make you laugh, nod in recognition, wince in pain, and shed a tear or two. I hope so, because again, the show wrecked me. So really, that's what it says on the tin. It's literally just about her being like this grumpy lady who on the surface hates everybody, but she's such a sensitive soul and life gets to her just so much. So I really want to read this. That's all the business that we needed to get through today. Thank you for attending this meeting. <laughs> I hope you have a pleasant day. I'm gonna go change out of this shirt, sweater, Dress is the word I'm looking for. Can you tell my brain is fried because I put myself in this? This is damp at this point. It's like I crawled out of a pool at this point. So I'm gonna go change and I'm gonna go read my silly little books and I'm gonna edit my silly little videos and I'm going to drink my silly little coffee and have a silly little chug of water after this video and I will see you next time. Okay, thank you, bye! Not bye. What it what is wrong with me? Don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to like, don't forget to be healthy and be happy, and don't forget to leave me a blood drop emoji for House of Hunger. I don't know why. It's not my favorite book of the month, but that's what we're doing, okay? Okay, now I can say bye. Okay, bye! <laughs>